a weak poor orphan boy joins the strongest assassin's clan, awakens a legendary weapon capable of destroying a city, making him an overpowered hero. Tetsumi is an ugly disgusting loser traveling with some merchants when suddenly the earth farted and unleashed one of you guys outside. Tatsumi came to their rescue and cut the dragon's hand off. He thought it was a worthy opponent because it was a first-class beast. The dragon got furious and turned its attention towards him, but he swiftly ended its life. The merchants thanked Tatsumi, who told them to remember his name as he would soon become the next Kirito. He talks about every country boy's dream of coming to the city to become the next Elon Musk. Yet, the merchants advised him to be careful. The capital had monsters worse than our viewers, and by monsters, they meant the people worse than Discord mods. People were monsters at heart. But it was too late to turn back now, he decided to make it work in the city and save his poor village. He enters the city and is taken aback by the beauty. He goes straight to the barracks and fills out the form of application. However, they revealed that he had no swag. Tatsumi felt offended. He knew he had dog in him to start as a commanding officer. The manager got mad and kicked him out. He explained that the city was going through a recession and they ain't got no time for broke otakus like him. Tatsumi thought about being a little girl and making a scene, but he might get taken to Epstein's island instead. While he was thinking, a girl with massive double-barreled honkers came to him and mentioned there was a quicker way to get government work. But first, he would need to pay for her lunch. Tatsumi accepts the deal but he quickly gets impatient and asks her how. The girl replies he only needs to set up his LinkedIn account and be rich. But since Tatsumi is broke and stupid, she told him she knew a guy in the military who can hire him for a good price so long as he has the money. Because you know, you must pay to get a job to get paid. Without ever a single line of thought, Tatsumi grabbed his bag of money that he earned by slaying beasts and gave it to her. She took the bag and told him to wait for her to come back. Tatsumi sat there for hours, but she didn't return. The bartender wanted to close Close the place, but Tatsumi insisted on staying and waiting for the girl. That's the moment when the bartender revealed that Tatsumi got scammed and fumbled the actual bag he had. Tatsumi got so angry that he wanted to report her to the authorities. Yet, the bartender explained that he was a moron for thinking he could bag both the hot girl and his money at the same time. Tatsumi not only realized that he made a huge mistake, but he also had to sleep on the streets. Luckily, a noble named Aria in a carriage was passing by and stopped after seeing Tatsumi. She was kind at heart and always helped homeless people get a place to crash. Although Tatsumi was suspicious of her, he had no other option as he was broke. She took him to her mansion and introduced him to her family. Tatsumi couldn't believe how big the mansion was and it was bigger than his entire village. After some basic conversation yada yada, Tatsumi revealed that he had come to the capital to work in the army because he wanted to save his poor village. Arya asked if he came alone, to which he explained that he had two other companions. He explains they left the village together to make some bank. He knew they were strong because he's the main protagonist and the other two are the protagonist's best friends. As they were about to depart, the chief gave Tatsumi a wooden statue to wish them luck. However, the group got separated on the way after being jumped by level 1 bandits. Yet, Tatsumi doesn't feel like he should worry about them because they're strong enough to protect themselves. The head of the family then promised to recommend Tatsumi to his military acquaintance and help him find his friends. Tatsumi happily thanked them and went to sleep. The next day, Arya took Tatsumi with her to the market for shopping. The guard showed him the imperial palace in the distance, impressing Tatsumi. The guard explains that's the heart of the capital where the emperor lives. Yet, he also revealed the emperor was a young kid who was being controlled by the prime minister. This manipulation resulted in the country slowly deteriorating. At that moment, Tatsumi realized the prime minister was with the IRS and the reason why his village is so poor from paying high taxes. The guard then showed him the posters of wanted criminals called the Night Raid. They were a group of six assassins that had been terrorizing the imperial capital. At night in his bedroom, he feels a murderous intent and gets up, thinking they could be attacked by night raid. He looked out the window and saw the five people outside, confirming his suspicion. He gets enraged to see the assassins attacking the family who just helped him and decides to step protect. He pays close attention to the night raid members and tries to find their weaknesses. He first notices Akame, who quickly eliminates the guards with one strike of her sword. He also notices a guy in huge armor. Seeing that they don't have any weaknesses at all, Tatsumi runs to protect Arya, while the girl who scammed him kills the head of the family while promising to also kill his daughter. Tatsumi runs into the woods and comes across a guard taking Arya to safety. The guard explained he already called the authorities and they should go inside the warehouse until they arrived. However, Akim arrives and kills the guard before they manage to get inside. She then tries to target Arya, but Tatsumi steps forward to protect her. Akim orders him to move away because he is not her target. However, she will low-diff him if he tries 
to get in her way. Despite the warning, Tatsumi felt like he should protect Arya. He knows he's no match for a game, but still tries to fight her off. Still, she easily stabs him in the chest. He thought it was Joever, but he was saved by the lucky charm given by his village chief. Yet, Akame was tired of playing this game and decided to slice his neck. Tatsumi is saved by Leon, the girl who scammed him. She tells Akame that she owes Tatsumi a favor from earlier and decides to show Tatsumi the dark side of the Imperial capital. She opened the warehouse doors and Tatsumi was shocked to find Arya had realistic Halloween costumes. Leon explained that Arya and her family lured people from the countryside to their house. They tricked them by using sweet words and then treated them as playthings and tortured them to death. Among the bodies, Tatsumi is shocked the most by seeing the one in front of him. He slowly walks toward her and asks if she is really Seo, his friend who came with him. Arya tries to sneak away, but Leon grabs her by the head. Tatsumi asks if what Leon just said is really true, and she confirms. Tatsumi remains silent when he suddenly heard a voice asking if he was really Tatsumi. Upon looking to the side, Tatsumi was shocked to see his friend Iyasu in jail. Iyasu explains that this is all Arya doing. She invited him and Seo to her home and put fentanyl in their food. When they woke up, they were already inside this warehouse. He lets his cries out, revealing that Arya tortured Seo to death. Yet, Arya still thought she hadn't done anything wrong. She erupted and spilled that she was entitled to do anything she wanted to the worthless people from the country. Basically, she just hates poor people. Leon told Akain to eliminate the last member of the family of sadists, but Tatsumi told them to wait. They think he's still going to defend Arya despite the truth, but Tatsumi simply kills her himself. Leon thinks it's impressive that despite Tatsumi's ranging emotions, he kept his calm and killed her without hesitation. Iyasu was glad Tatsumi was able to take revenge, but starts coughing Kool-Aid. Tatsumi tries to help his friend, but Akame reveals he's suffering from the last stage of Ligma. She reveals there's no cure for Ligma and Iyasu is in his final moments. With his final words, Iyasu reveals that Seo that he knows where the One Piece is, and then he dies. After those words, Iyasu dies for plot reasons, making Tatsumi question what's wrong with this city. Since their mission is done, Akame starts walking away, but Leon wants to bring Tatsumi with them because she believes he has the courage and skill to help them. She starts dragging him despite his complaints about wanting to stay to give his friends a proper burial. Leon told him to calm down because she would bring their bodies to their hideout. She then introduced him to the other members as the new member of Night Raid. Leon asked Bulat to take care of him. The next day, Leon asked if Tatsumi had decided whether to join them or not. She believed in his talent, but he still wasn't sure about becoming a criminal. She then showed him around their base camp and introduced the other members properly. The first was Bulat, who looks like he's a stand user with Jasuk's haircut. Tatsumi was confused because he hadn't seen him last night, but Bulat revealed he was the guy in armor. During dinner, Akame also asked if Tatsumi decided to join. Despite spending the whole day with them, he still didn't make his decision. Later, Tatsumi meets Night Raid's leader Najenda, who asks the same question. Tatsumi reveals that he came to the capital to make money and save his village from poverty. Bulat explained that his village and the country became poor because of the corrupt politicians, and the only way to solve this problem is by eliminating the cause of it. She explains that Night Raid was born because the Revolutionary Army needed a small team to carry intelligence or assassination missions. At the moment, they only take care of pest control, but once they get the orders, they will make their move to reach the prime minister and administer some funny business. They reveal the prime minister couldn't care less about killing those who opposed him. Najender reveals that it was the prime minister who plotted everything to make sure the kid won the battle for succession. And since then, the young emperor always needs to take the prime minister's advice to make any kind of decision. Some people tried to warn the emperor that he was being deceived, but this absolute cretin would ask the prime minister if he was being tricked. As a result, even high-rank officials or nobles would be sent to the gulag by the emperor under the Prime Minister's advice. For that reason, Najenda believes that once the source was crushed, the nation would be born anew. She invites him again to join the Night Raid, but Tatsumi has one last doubt. He wants to know if that new nation will treat its citizens well. Najenda confirms and Tatsumi realizes that their job is to find the bad guys and take out the trash. In short, he thinks they're playing Assassin's Creed who fight for justice. Everyone laughs at him, but he makes the decision to join the group. Tatsumi went to investigate the capital the next day with Mine and noticed how unhappy the people were. He asked Mine why many people were suffering
suffering, and she told him the people were living through a recession in an empire ruled by fear. Only one social segment was doing well, while the others lived in slums. Tatsumi then heard a commotion nearby and asked Mine what it was about. She told him it was a public execution which was a common thing here. What Tatsumi saw shocked him to his core, it was a terrible sight of numerous executions altogether. Later, Tatsumi was given his first mission to become an official member of Night Raid. He had to eliminate Ogre, a member of the Imperial Police. According to their investigation, Ogre was being bribed by an oil merchant. Whenever the oil merchant would do something wrong, the Ogre would pin the blame on innocent people. Innocent families were destroyed by these crimes. Akane told Tatsumi that he was not a real assassin until he had completed his first job and made his report. Later, Leon took Tatsumi to the main street of the capital where he met the ogre. Tatsumi approached him to ask something and took him to an empty area. There, Tatsumi one-shots the ogre with everything he had. After successfully eliminating the target, Tatsumi is commended by an agenda. Yet, she orders him to train with Bulat because he still needs to become stronger. Even though the training was rough, Bulat encouraged him to not give up or else he'll touch his balls. He showed him how to edge his emotions just to last twice as long. He was also taught to fight in group combat because Tatsumi lacked teamwork. The two quickly started to bond to the point where Tatsumi started to see Bulat as an older brother. Bulat was happy with Tatsumi's progression and decided to show him his trick. He used his stand, Gundam Seed Destiny, to transform into his armor mode. Bulat's imperial relic made Tatsumi curious and he decided to ask the group if there were more. The group confirms and reveals that a thousand years ago, the founding emperor wanted to find a way to protect his empire forever. After thinking about multiple options, the emperor realized that his best answer would be weapons and armor that could be passed down to people with glasses. Therefore, he ordered his soldiers to collect materials from legendary beasts and rare metals like Orichalcum. And with these materials, they managed to create 48 unique pieces of equipment that could never be reproduced again. Every single relic was powerful, but some could rival the strength of a thousand men. However, there was a civil war 500 years ago. As a result, half of the relics were lost and ended up dispersed all over the world. They reveal that Akame's sword Mirasame is one of those relics. When the sword cuts a person's skin, it injects a deadly poison into the wound. Leon also has the Beast Ruler called Lionel. It's a belt-shaped relic that transforms her into Mr. Beast, who only punches people. As a result, her physical abilities and senses are increased. Mine has the spirit artillery called the Pumpkin, shaped like a gun, it was powered by the user's fighting spirit. In short, its power depends on the level of danger mine currently is. Bulatsen Curcio is a demonic armor with its own will. It's almost impossible to crack its defense and can also make him invisible for a short period. However, Incursio will kill its user if the armor doesn't feel like he's worthy. Magenda explains that every relic has been used throughout time with the intent to kill. Their secondary mission was to collect the Imperial relics. They had the task of taking the relics from their current wielders or simply destroying them, all for the goal of making the revolution army stronger. Nagenda then gives Tatsumi a book of relics and tells him to learn more about it. Tatsumi quickly became excited because he thought there would be a relic that could resurrect the dead. He wanted to find that relic and bring his friends back to life. However, Bulat interrupted him, revealing that was impossible. Those words were a tough pill for Tatsumi to swallow, but he had to clench his fist to soften the pill. Later at night, Tatsumi sat alone outside to clear his head. He thought about how his life turned out after leaving the village when Sheil appeared. He opened up to her, explaining explaining that he really hoped there was a relic that could bring his friends back to life. Yet, he still couldn't believe this was really a goodbye. Tears start to run down his face and Sheil hugs him. She tells him to cry harder because what happens next will shock him. Those words made him laugh because he never expected a superior to be gentle with a subordinate. Yet, he remembers that she's the normal member of the squad and also the kindest. Then a few days later, Mine tells everyone that Sheil died in a battle. Tatsumi remembers their conversation a few nights ago and asks Mine, who witnessed everything who killed Sheil. He wants to rush to the capital and avenge the only person who comforted him when he needed to, but Nagenda stops him. She thinks that rushing into the capital without a plan will only make him join Sheil and his friends. Tatsumi refused to hear common sense because he was blinded by revenge. This forces Bulat to knock some sense back into his face, mentioning that as long as they join Night Raid, they should be prepared to die at any moment. Nagenda adds that Sheil's death was not in vain because the Empire now knows that it takes a relic user to kill another relic user. She alerts everyone that from now on, all their opponents will be relic wielders, and they must bet their lives to fight and collect more relics. After that statement, Tatsumi returns to the place where he talked to Sheil nights ago. He notices the bright sky while remembering how she comforted them. While lost in thoughts, he suddenly gets the feeling of a warm embrace from behind. 
It feels the same as Sheil in the last time, but he sees nobody when he turns around. He then realizes this was her trying to comfort him one last time. When he could not sleep at night, he went to get a glass of water and encountered Akane grabbing a snack. When inquired about it, Akane told him that it was Sheil's favorite snack for the offering. As they worked in the shadows, her name would never appear in the Revolutionary Army's records, so she wanted to honor her as much as she could. Tatsumi praised her for being so composed even after losing a friend. Akane got mad and grabbed his collar. She could never get used to the pain of losing a close friend, even if she saw many lives fall before her. She could not let her emotions interfere with the mission which is why she acted as if she was fine. Tatsumi had never seen Akane so shaken up before. He figured being miserable would not bring her back, so he had to face forward like a man. He punched himself and refocused on the mission at hand. He had to earn money for his village until the revolution. He then promised Akame to never die and vowed never to make her grieve, which is a big mistake and you'll see why. The next day Tatsumi trained hard with Akame. He told her to treat this as a real battle even though she wanted him to take a break. Bulat came and punched him and advised him to always be mindful of the surroundings. Bulat asked why he was so pumped up today and Tatsumi told him he wanted to get stronger. He promised Akame and he intended to fulfill it. Bulat was happy about this change and wanted to train Tatsumi himself. The next mission was to target two officials. Akame and Lubbock were paired and Bulat and Tatsumi together to guard the targets. They were on the outskirts of the capital on a cruise in disguise. Bulat was in his armor invisible, while he investigated the inside of the cruise, while Tatsumi was keeping an eye out for anyone that looked suspicious. He heard a flute playing and people next to him started to fall unconscious. Tatsumi felt weak, but he used his strength to put his Apple AirPods on his ear. He managed to go out on the deck. He guessed it was a Spotify premium because he could still hear the music without the ads. Suddenly, a man appeared from behind and told him that if he had fallen asleep, he would be left alone, but now that he was standing, he was the target. Tatsumi figured that he was one of the people who were pretending to be Night Raid. He handed Tatsumi a sword so he could have battle experience and told him to come at him. Tatsumi moved to attack him right away, but the man attacked first and Tatsumi had to dodge. The man then threw his half-weapon towards Tatsumi and he got hit in the stomach. The weapon was the imperial relic called the Twofold Cleaver Belvark. The man threw the weapon again and Tatsumi thought it was a great opportunity to attack simultaneously. But Bulat stopped him because the enemy was already anticipating the attack, which meant he could have been severely injured. The man asked Bulat how he was able to move under the influence of the flute. Bulat replied that he had fiery blood that coursed through him that was not easily quelled. Bulat had the crazy idea to injure himself so he could break free of the music's hold on him. The man introduced himself as Deidara from the Imperial Army. Bulat asked Tatsumi to witness the battle and committed to his memory. Bulat then proceeded to summon his Imperial Relic Incursia. He got ready to attack, but the flute boy attacked him from behind of which Bulat was mindful. This is what he meant when he was training Tatsumi. He killed Diodara with one strike and was able to fend off the other two. Tatsumi admired his big brother as he easily defeated the enemy. Bulat told him that when he was in the army, he was known as the 100-man slayer. One of the other men got up and Bulat was caught off guard because it was General Liver. The general had an imperial relic, Black Marlin, which allowed him to control the water. It was created from an organ of a water beast. The wielder was allowed to freely manipulate any liquid within range. It was unfortunate for Bulat to encounter encounter him in such a location with only a water body surrounding them. The general and Bulat engaged in a battle and were equally matched. Bilat was able to kill any beast that the general summoned. Bilat was getting injured as he was fighting back, but the general had another trick up his sleeve. His greatest technique is Water Dragon's Divine Conquest. Bilat was reaching his limit as the general continued to attack. Finally, Incursio was deactivated because it had taken enough damage. Bulat started to smile because Liver thought he had won, but he was bleeding from his ears. All his techniques had torn his body apart from the inside. This meant Bulat was able to successfully defeat him as well. Not being able to accept defeat, the general then took out his liquid fentanyl from his coat and injected himself with it. He had taken the liberty of boosting his strength because he needed every advantage to win against Bulat. They both charged towards each other and their swords clashed. The amount of power that radiated shocked Tatsumi. Despite their injuries, they both were still going. Bulat mustered all his power and broke the general's sword. It seemed like Bulat had won, but the general used his hidden ability, Blades of Blood. The general's blood turned into sharp blades and attacked Bulat, 
He tried to defend and block, but many of the blades pierced his body. Bulat figured that the vial was not just a strength booster, but also a deadly poison. The general before dying told Bulat there was no cure for the poison and that he would see him on the other side. Bulat started to feel weak, but the battle was not done. The third member of the three beasts was still standing. He came up to them saying the blades of blood were not the only trump card. The real trump card was Niall, and his hidden ability called the fierce deity rising. His relic, Scream was not just for manipulating others, but he could use it on his body as well. He transformed from being a discord twink flute playing femboy into Gigachad Anya on steroids from Spy Family. Bulat entrusted his imperial relic to Tatsumi, the incursio key. Its rightful owner was able to call forth the armor using the key, but it caused immense strain upon its wielder. So Nayao told Tatsumi not to test his luck, he did not want his opponent to die before the battle. It was a sarcastic remark that intended to destroy Tatsumi's confidence, and it did work. This made Tatsumi ponder, maybe he was not worthy of such a relic, but Bulat got up and punched Tatsumi to let his enemy tell him what to think. Bulat knew he was worthy of the relic. This trust made Tatsumi gain his composure. Compatibility with the relic was all about the feelings it inspired when it was first seen. And Tatsumi was excited when he first saw Incursia. Bulat encouraged him to go for it, and it motivated Tatsumi to pick up the key and shout, I'm the Rizzler. The rage filled it up and Tatsumi was able to successfully summon the armor. The armor changed its form to suit Tatsumi's body. Nayao was terrified of the raw form of the armor, which is El Diablo Chupacabra. Incursio was created by purifying raw materials taken from the tyrant, a dragon beast with a life force stronger than any other. Even after being formed into a relic, the dragon's flesh was still alive. Tatsumi's burning passion caused Incursio to evolve. Tatsumi was able to feel the armor's power flowing through him, and he challenged Nayao. They both charged toward each other, and with a single punch Tatsumi ended Nayao's life. Tatsumi had proved to be worthy. Bulat was happy and contended Tatsumi was so strong and knew that one day he would surpass him as well. As Bulat took his last breath, he promised to watch over him. Tatsumi saw him lose consciousness and ran over to him, but he had passed away. Tatsumi could not believe he had died. He screamed and cried loudly for his brother. It was for Bulat that he won. Nagenda was leaving for the Revolutionary Army headquarters to deliver the relics they had acquired from the three servants of Ezdef. Another reason was to request reinforcements. She hoped they would have talented individuals at their disposal. Tatsumi was sorry for causing her so much trouble, but she assured him that it was because of him they acquired some army relics. Although the Empire looked peerless, their army had taken a severe blow. Tatsumi's efforts would significantly mitigate the risk that they would face during the revolution. He saved the passengers of the crews and thousands of soldiers who would have died fighting the three. Nagenda appreciated his efforts and his hard work. Leon did not want to inflate his ego, so she never told Tatsumi what Bulat said about him. Bulat believed that Tatsumi was green when he came, but as long as he trained rigorously, he has the potential even to surpass Bulat. Nagenda told him to be proud and keep on surviving before departing. After she returned from the headquarters, she introduced the new member of the Night Raid. Suzanu was a lightning speed warrior. He was an autonomous living relic, so he was easy to handle. Suzanu oversaw saw Tatsumi's training while he trained near a waterfall and crushed any boulder that came in contact with it. Suzunu advised him not to apply his full strength blindly, but to find a weakness. If Tatsumi was able to discover that weakness, it would benefit him greatly. A few days later, Tatsumi met up with Lubbock, and they went to a secret base in the capital to discuss their plan. They thought it was time for the revolutionary army to rise. The corrupt government had already pushed the citizens close to the breaking point. To deliver the final blow, the revolutionary army would launch a rebellion from the south. The rebellion would advance towards the capital and overthrow the government. The empire underestimated the revolutionary army, but once they advanced towards a surprised capital, the fortifications would surrender. The capital then would surely send in their trump card, Commander-in-Chief Budo. This would mean the palace's security would be greatly compromised. At the given opportunity, the night raid would assassinate the prime minister. The first task was to infiltrate the castle wearing St. Laurent hoodies. Tatsumi was cleverly able to take advantage of the commotion and sneak inside. Love and Tatsumi were ready to deal with any situation that may come their way, but they wanted to minimize as many civilian casualties as possible. It would have been better to get rid of the Prime Minister sooner. As they walked together, Lub asked about his plans after the revolution. Tatsumi had never given it any thought, so he asked Lub about it. Lub wanted to continue to run his bookstore in peace and turn it into a franchise, which was yet another big mistake. Once successful, he wanted to propose to Nejenda. Tatsumi was happy for him. Lub then started to tease Tatsumi with mine. He noticed 
asked how things had changed between them over time, but Tatsumi denied such allegations. Their talk was interrupted by a member of the resistance. She led them inside the palace. Her father was in charge of the emperor's education, but her parents were framed by the prime minister and arrested. Other members of the bureaucracy were covertly in contact with the revolutionary army. It was Tatsumi and Love's role to work with them and support the invasion from within. Tatsumi because he was able to become invisible and Love with his espionage expertise. As they reached a door that would directly lead them inside, something was wrong. Normally someone would confirm from the other side by knocking, but there was blood seeping from underneath the door. Love asked them to step back as he peeked inside. He saw a bloodbath. It meant they were ratted out. The bodies started to inflate from diarrhea and caused a huge stinky explosion. The three of them were able to get away but were surrounded by the private army. Sura, who was the son of the prime minister, took care of the resistance members. He knew about the night raid and their plan and wanted to be entertained by them. Sura was able to recognize Tatsumi from a mission before where he was responsible for releasing danger beasts. This infuriated Tatsumi who charged towards him. But there was a sudden lightning and a huge man landed in front of them. It was Budo, the commander in chief. Tatsumi could feel the pressure from this giant. Budo informed Tatsumi that he had wronged the empire with his treasonous acts and was condemned to die by his imperial relic. The thunder god's rage, a dream lunch. Budo punched Tatsumi in the chest and he flew far away but he used his sword to lower the impact. Even though Tatsumi barely escaped the attack that could have been fatal, he summoned his relic in Curcio. Sensing the danger, Lub tried to interfere and stop the fight, but Sira blocked him. He was going to be his opponent. Lub was engaged in a tough fight and he used his cross tail to attack and defend himself. Sura's imperial relic Shambhala was able to teleport him or anyone he wanted as long as he had marked the location first. Lub knew he was in deep as it was a powerful relic that controlled space and time. It was exhausting to use again and again so Sura injected himself with the same serum as General Liver to boost his strength. Now he was able to teleport as much as he wanted and had made a lot of markings all over the palace. Lub tried to run away but there was no point as Sura was able to reach him in no time. Lub had an idea to jump into the sky as there were no markings there, but Sura reached him there as well in an instant. There was nowhere for Lub to go. Meanwhile, Tatsumi and Budo were engaged in a fierce battle. Tatsumi realized that even though Budo was strong, his attacks left openings. He decided to dodge his attacks and find out a weakness. Budo then asked his name because he was honest and had not faltered once in his swordsmanship. A lot of discipline was needed to become this skilled, but he wanted to deliver justice to those who had wronged the Empire and the Emperor. He commanded a powerful lightning which consumed Tatsumi. Love was held by the member of the resistance group who was leading them inside, but Sura killed her without any hesitation because she interfered. He called her a toy that butted in their fight. This enraged Love as she was not a toy, but a human being, but for Sura everyone in the capital was a toy. His goal was to surpass his father and take over the throne. Love had completely changed his demeanor after hearing him treat people like trash. He told him it was over for him as within a single movement, he sliced off Sura's hand. Sura was left utterly shocked and the guards came running for him. Lub took his hand in which he held his relic and stopped everyone or he would cut off more parts of him. Lub spread his wires all over the area while he was pretending to run away from Sura. He figured out most of the mark's location when Sura was busy showing off. But before he could ask questions, the same girl from before got up and stabbed Lub in the back. She asked Sura to let her parents go but Sura revealed while laughing manically that they were killed a long time ago. Love fell on the ground as Sura was able to pick up his relic again. He then showed his domain expansion as he transported Love into the space from where no one ever returned. But Love was not going to go out so easily, he had used his wires to hold on to Sura's arm while he was transported in space. He then proceeded to pull Sura with him into space. He could not stand someone ruling the world where people were treated like toys. Sura wanted to rule the world and did not want to die, but Love had to take him down. Before Sura could react, Lub used a spear to pierce his body. Lub pulled the strings and killed him. As they both fell from the sky, Lub looked at his relic for the last time. He remembered all their good times together. His last words were sorry to Nagenda and leaving the rest to Tatsumi. He fell on the spikes in front of Tatsumi, who was tied down by Budo and his men. He could not believe his eyes as he saw Lub's lifeless body and screamed. Tatsumi was arrested. They planned to use him as an example for those opposing the Empire. People started to gather in the city center as they saw the public public execution poster of Tatsumi. Among the spectators were Nagenda and Mine, and they were rightfully upset to see their team
team member like that. The whole crowd gathered at the arena where the emperor gave a speech about rebels trying to take down the empire. The emperor told the citizens not to lend their ears to such rabble-raising nonsense. To showcase their strength and power, they were going to publicly execute a member of the insurgents' night raid, and on a cross came Tatsumi all tied up. The emperor blamed all the capital's chaos on these conspirators and deceived innocent citizens. But Tatsumi, despite being on a precipice of death, had his eyes full of hope and rage. The citizens roared as the emperor promised the empire's invincibility. His death, one of the empire generals, moved closer to Tatsumi to shred his clothes off. She pointed the sword's edge next to his neck when a bullet interrupted her. It was mine with her relic. She called out to Tatsumi for being stupid and getting caught. She fired a few more rounds of bullets to create a distraction for Nagenda, Suzanu, and Leon to detonate the bombs in the arena. They were planted by Lubbock and Nagenda promised to put them to good use. The ground started to tremble and Esdef fell in. Budo then showed up and used his lightning to paralyze the stingray on which Nagenda and the rest flew in. But they took this opportunity to jump and save themselves. Budo continued to use his relic to target the members while Akame was inside the palace eliminating the guards. Nagenda and Suzanu came face to face with Esdef. They engage in a tough battle where Esdef is single-handedly stronger than the other two. Mine and Leon fought against Budo, who continued to use his lightning to attack. Leon took her opportunity and used it to get closer to Budo as she was a hand-to-hand -hand combat fighter. She held Budo tightly so Mine could use her gun to blast him without him moving. Budo laughed because she would be caught in the attack as well, but she had impressive regeneration skills. Mine believed in Leon and with full force blasted at Budo, but he used his defensive system to block it. He was standing with no injuries while Leon was paralyzed from the shock. Although impressed by their capabilities, he was sad that they had chosen the wrong path. Frustrated, Mine said she would follow her own path, whether it was wrong or not. Budo blasted her with his lightning and injured her, but Mine told him whenever she was in trouble, her relic would become stronger. She deliberately put herself in harm's way, so her attacks would match that of Budo. But it was still not enough to defeat the giant of a man. Akame eliminated the guards easily, so she could retrieve Incursio for Tatsumi. As death used her relic and froze Suzanu in an ice sculpture. Knowing Esdef was her opponent, she used her hidden ability, Magatama Manifestation, to transform Suzanu into a killing machine. She told Esdef the reason they had survived for so long was because they were tough. She told her never to lower her guard, even if her opponent was encased in ice. Suzanu's only goal was to defeat Esdef, but she was still easily able to dodge his attacks. Mine was still going, and knowing who her opponent was, Tatsumi tried to stop her, but she was confident that she could win this battle. She was dead set on saving Tatsumi, who was tied up. Budo understood that to finish her, he had to attack her with full force. He summoned the lightning and shot at her. Mine fell on the ground, but she was still determined to survive the revolution and come out on top. For the final blow, they both summoned their utmost power. Budo used his imperial relic's ultimate technique called the Solid Shooter. He was able to gather a huge bolt of lightning and Mine begged her relic to help her win this. So, it transformed and stole all the power from Budo and used it to counterattack him. He was in disbelief as he found himself on the brink of death. Mine had won as she promised, and Budo was dead. She was satisfied, but she fell as her energy was completely depleted. Akane came running to Tatsumi and released him from the chains. He took his relic from her hands and rushed towards Mine. He was able to save her from falling on the ground and held her while she was unconscious in his arms. Nagenda saw everything unfold and yelled to everyone to withdraw as their mission was accomplished, but Esdef was not going to let them go. She summoned a weapon in her hand, but Suzanu also attacked her using a very long sword. Esdef blocked it by building an ice wall. Nagenda denoted a bomb, while Esdef used her hidden ability to freeze everyone before her. It was her most taxing ability. It was so draining that she could only use it once a day. As she stopped the time and space, she walked towards Suzanu and stabbed him in the heart. The time returned to normal, everyone was shocked to see the event unfold. Suzanu turned to ice while Esdef kicked him so he could shatter into little pieces. She commended him for making her use her full strength. Nagenda thought of recovering Suzanu's core, but Esdef broke it as well. It was all over. Nagenda was never the one to give up. She used her relic, Magatama Manifestation, for the third time to regenerate Suzanu. It was impossible to use for the fourth time, otherwise she would die. Nagenda was pouring her life force into this manifestation and was gladly doing so because she was sure reinforcements were on their way now that Budo was defeated. Suzanu attacked Esdef, and she was able to detect an increase in his powers. Tatsumi wanted to help, but Nagenda asked him to run away. Akame helped Nagenda, as she explained Suzanu's powers had not increased, and there was no way he could defeat Esdef. Tatsumi was still worried for Suzanu. He explained to Tatsumi that he had lived a thousand years as a relic, but he had never been happier than the days he had spent with the night raid.
parade, he bid them all farewell. They all got on Nagenda's Stingray, but Esdeath did not want them to leave. She wanted to kill them all. Luckily, Suzanu was there to block her. He used a mirror to reflect her attacks and buy them the time they needed to escape. He was going to give away his life trying to protect them. Suzanu was a humanoid relic, and he had played all his strongest cards. Now it was time for him to play the role of the pawn. As Death commended him, not as a relic, but as a warrior, they both engaged in final combat. Tatsumi was taking mine to their hideout place, so she could recover and feel better, but she wanted him to put her down. He took her to a nearby stream and laid her near it. She held his hand to tell him she was satisfied because she was able to save him. He wanted to pull herself together, but she couldn't regenerate like Leon. She wanted to fight alongside him till the very end, but she succumbed to her injuries and died. After returning to the base, Tatsumi asked why they sacrificed so much to save him. Nagenda told him not to be self-absorbed because they just stopped the public execution to maintain their revolutionary army's morale. They were also able to successfully eliminate Budo, who was a thorn in their plan for years. Their gains were greater than the losses which made Tatsumi mad. Leon stopped him because Nagenda was hurting too, but she was looking at the mission objectively. They lost Suzanu too who fulfilled his mission as a relic. As the only survivors, they carried the hopes of those who had passed away. It was a heavy burden that they could not abandon lightly. Leon reminded everyone if they threw in the towel now, the dead would not be able to rest in peace. Tatsumi agreed to put an end to the suffering. Later, he went outside with Mine's ribbon and promised to create a world without any discrimination, an ideal world she wanted to create. It seemed like they were closer to their dream. The next day, the public started to revolt against the empire. The capital was surrounded by people demanding to surrender. The emperor was worried the nation was going to fall on his account. The prime minister Honest stepped in to tell the emperor that people could not be depended upon. Everyone was flustered and he was well aware of the emperor's pain. The emperor was sad that his people would be rebelling against him. The prime minister had always told him how good of an emperor he was. The prime minister had a plan and advised him to be firm and demonstrate authority. He first recommended Esdeath to deal with rebel spies in the countryside while they execute the ones in the capital to give a warning to the citizens. At the base, Nijenda thanked every member with a warm heart for all their hard work till now. Leon asked her not to act like they were never going to meet each other. Nijenda told her that it all depended on whenever they wanted to meet again in the future. Leon was confident they were going to be successful. Akame and Tatsumi agreed. Nijenda explained their last mission. It was to eradicate corruption at its source and take down Prime Minister Honest. Nijenda was going to keep the guards occupied for as long as they could while Tatsumi had to kill the Prime Minister within that time. They would overthrow the current empire and begin anew where the citizens could live peacefully. This speech stirred the nation's spirits and they all charged towards the palace gates. Leon, using her physical abilities, broke into the palace and she was right because the palace security was light. Tatsumi and Akame joined her. The three of them eliminated the guards on their way to the throne room. At the room's entrance, many more guards seemed distressed, so they gave the guards a chance to leave if they were not prepared to die, but they all were determined. Suddenly, they were met by by one of the Jaegers who happened to know Tatsumi. It was apparent that he was not going to let them inside the room. Whenever Run took on a job, he made sure he saw it through to the end. He told Tatsumi that right or wrong was up for debate for future historians. He then told the guards to leave so their lives could be spared. Run used his imperial relic and grew wings which could be used to attack as well. The three of them hid behind pillars. Run knew the current empire was sure to collapse but he did not support them because their methods involved too much bloodshed. Run was a teacher in his hometown, but his students were abducted and killed by bandits. However, the government did not deem the act a crime because it was a poor town. He bore a grudge against the empire. Leon did not understand why he sided with the empire then and attacked. It was because he wanted to change the empire his way from within. He was disappointed when the night raid started a violent rebellion. Leon was done arguing and she punched one of the pillars so it fell on Run. It created a distraction for Tatsumi and Akame to move forward and leave Run to Leon. She promised she would be fine and Tatsumi, although hesitant, asked her not to die on him. She asked him to save a punch for the Prime Minister. She then grabbed a pillar and charged towards Run who easily destroyed it. He then used his hidden ability, Divine Wings. His wings started to shine brightly. He transformed because Leon underestimated his hand-to-hand -hand combat skills. Looking at his transformed form, Leon knew she was in trouble. In the throne room, the Emperor was asking the Prime Minister Honest how was the battlefront. He revealed that it was unfavorable. The rebels were fighting with passion and idealism while their forces withered before them. The emperor asked if he had let his people down, but the prime minister reassured him that he did his absolute best. The emperor believed that the prime minister was always on his side. So, when he suggested that an example should be set of the traitors and blood should be spilled, only then will the rebellion settle down, the emperor agreed. 
Suddenly, Tatsumi crushed the door and emerged with a determined look. The Emperor feared the night raid, and when the Prime Minister shouted for the guards, Akim stepped in telling him she had eliminated all of them. Her next target was Prime Minister Honest. She took her sword out and went to attack him, but was repelled. His ultimate imperial relic had been activated. Akim was surrounded by the guards, and the Emperor was mad that they had sparked the rebellion and thrown the nation into chaos. Tatsumi wanted the Emperor to come to his senses and see the truth. He reasoned that the Empire had been in the grip of tyranny for years, and the weak had been suffering the most. No one would ever come to the rescue of such social classes, and they died while clinging on to that hope. Tatsumi remembered his friends and their last moments, how they must have felt when they suffered at the hands of tyrants. A cruel nation had to change. The Prime Minister asked the Emperor not to be deceived by his words, but Tatsumi revealed to him that it was his words that deceived the young Emperor. The Prime Minister denied such allegations, saying the advice he gave to the Emperor was out of love. Tatsumi was was done with him and asked him to quit babbling. The Prime Minister then asked the Emperor to bring down the Iron Hammer of Justice on the rebels. The Emperor stood up declaring the nation as his. He raised his hand and the palace started to tremble and out came the Empire's trump card Shikotaser. Its strength rivals that of God. Its role was to judge those who had betrayed the Empire. Tatsumi and Akam could not believe their eyes. Even the citizens who saw this unfold were terrified. It was so huge that it broke the palace walls. That is why it was the legendary Imperial Relic and the Prime Minister had not admitted defeat. The Emperor shouted that the Empire had stood the test of time by the grace and will of God, and no one could defy God. A laser-like light came out of the eyes of Shikotazer and completely obliterated the town in the distance. Tatsumi saw this and got mad that he just killed hundreds of innocent people. He asked him to stop, but the Prime Minister was encouraging such acts because it made the Emperor look valiant. He told him that his parents would be proud if they had not died in an unfortunate accident. Shikotazer could only be used by those of imperial bloodline. This proved that the Emperor was the true leader and heir. This pumped the Emperor more, and he used the laser again to target a nearby place. The Prime Minister knew that as long as they had this power, no one would defy them. Once the nation was theirs again, the ignorant citizens would rebuild their cities again. Akame was fighting the personal bodyguards of the Emperor, and they were powerful. While Tatsumi was standing on top of a nearby building and shouting to put an end to it all, he could not believe how an Emperor could treat his capital like it was nothing. The Emperor wanted the night raid to reap what they had Home. He targeted Tatsumi and destroyed the building he was on, but he was able to escape the laser. Tatsumi questioned his authority and his treatment of his subjects, but the Emperor was not ready to give up his empire. The Emperor had shouldered the burden of this nation from the day he was born and Tatsumi had no idea how hard it must have been. He then punched Tatsumi and he fell on rubble. As Shikutazer was about to use the laser again to target the civilians nearby, Tatsumi ran to their rescue and picked them up before they could be obliterated. Tatsumi then went to the Shikotazer and asked the the emperor inside to look around at the havoc he had created and his city burning. As the emperor did, he was shocked at what he had done. Within seconds the city was destroyed, and people were left homeless and injured. The prime minister urged him not to listen to him as he was swaying him and continue to pass judgment. He told him to harden his heart or whatever they had done would be for nothing. Although the emperor was shaken up, he listened to the prime minister. Tatsumi flew towards him to stop this mess, but Shikotazer grabbed him in his ginormous hands and threw him on the ground. This impact caused huge destruction. Tatsumi was not going to go down so easily, he marveled at such power and wanted the emperor to use it against real evil. He asked if he was okay with being a puppet of the prime minister. This infuriated the emperor, and he stomped on Tatsumi, but he barely escaped the fatal attack when Wave, a soldier of the empire, came to the rescue and picked Tatsumi up. He told him that he fought to protect the people, and he did not support what the emperor was doing. Wave tried to reason with the emperor to calm himself, but it was a holy war for the emperor, and he could not back down. Wave told Tatsumi that it was them both who could stop this and the Emperor from destroying more towns. He did not have to ask Tatsumi twice who was ready to go to any length to defend the innocent. Wave then came face to face with the Emperor and told him that he had not joined the rebel forces but was protecting the powerless was his duty. The Prime Minister was scared for his own life now and tried to escape thinking it was the wisest decision. As long as he was alive he could try again and again. But as he sought a safe passage to escape he came face to face with 
with Leon. She called him the lowest form of life in the world, and she was not going to let him get away. As she moved closer to kill him, he used his imperial relic, a ring to destroy her imperial relic. He laughed maniacally because he knew she was powerless without her belt. It was vital to keep one's trump card close to one's chest, he told Leon. She was utterly shocked as she lost her relic. He then charged her guilty of terrorizing him and took out a gun. This was his way of justice. He sentenced her to die and shot her twice. She started to bleed out without her regenerative abilities. But she was not going to die so easily. She went to him and punched him in the face. He fell crying that it hurt him. He could not believe the amount of strength she possessed. She was tough because she grew up in the slums and knew how to survive in the cruel world. He shot her many more times until his gun had depleted all its bullets. Relic or not relic, her soul was stronger than whatever rotten thing the prime minister had. She continued to punch his face until he died. Tatsumi and Wave were trying to break the Shikotazer. All their efforts were in vain, but they were still fighting through. If they gave up, it would all be over. Tatsumi attacked him from below, and it caused an electric shock to the Emperor. The Emperor was surprised to feel such an impact. Tatsumi then remembered what Suzanu once told him, no matter how sturdy something may appear, it always had a weakness. He asked Wave to create an opening for him so he could attack it. Wave was able to attack numerously in one place which cracked the armor. Tatsumi then used it to his advantage and punched it until it broke down. This again electrocuted the Emperor. The relic must be putting great pressure on the Emperor, which meant it was weakest where the load was concentrated. Mad with rage, the Emperor attacked Tatsumi and Wave. The Emperor asked them to give up and stop struggling. But it was Tatsumi, he would never give up. He had faced countless tragedies to get to that point, and he was carrying the dreams and hopes of his fallen comrades. He was not going to let them down. He remembered Bulat's words when he said the road they were taking was paved with tragedy. But they chose to walk it and do the dirty work to bring about a new world. He told him to shout and fill in Curcio with his raging spirit. As he shouted, his armor evolved once again. It was way stronger and had wings which helped him fly. The emperor asked him not to come any closer as he attacked Tatsumi with powerful laser beams. Tatsumi dodged them all and came in contact with Shikotazer. With his full strength, he pushed in on the giant figure. While the emperor was screaming with pain and rage, so was Tatsumi. Wave who was on the ground asked Tatsumi to stop or he would die. But Tatsumi was not going to give up. He had promised to come on top and live. Tatsumi with one last push, destroyed Shikutazer. He had won and defeated the emperor. As the figure was going to fall on the innocent civilians who were blocked off, Tatsumi, although he was going to collapse, tried to stop Shikotazer. It was his one last mission. This put a lot of physical strain on Tatsumi because it was no easy feat to stop a huge imperial relic, and his relic was on the brink of breaking. But he was able to save innocent lives at the cost of his own. He was a hero to countless people as he laid down his life for them. He was bleeding profusely from all his wounds on the body. Akam ran towards him, and while taking his last breaths, he told her that he was going to break his promise. She yelled at him for breaking his promise that he was going to come back alive, but she held him in her arms. Incursio vanished as Tatsumi gave his final breaths. Watch this next video. See you on the next one.